I know that my man just uh, prayed, but I would love just to pray again um, before we dive into uh, God's word. Just a reminder, just a reminder um, that, that the, the, the book that you hold, the Bible, it's, it's a living, breathing book. It means that there's, there's a, a place in the Bible where it says that the scriptures are God breathed out, that this, the, the words that you have are the very essence of who God is. And, and so these are not simply words that we want to dissect and understand, but, but words that when we open our hearts and our minds can, can give life and, and joy and purpose and meaning. And so we want to ask God uh, to do that with his word, that he, would, uh, that he would breathe upon his God-breathed word and that it would do something in our hearts this morning. Let's pray. Lord God, our desperate need is your voice. It's for you to speak, for you to move, and it's for you to be lifted up in our midst. And God, I pray that, that you would minimize distractions, that you would move away thoughts and doubts and questions, and, and that your voice would just pierce through it all. God, I pray that we would leave changed and impacted, um, not just this weekend, but, but, but right now. It's in your son's name we pray. And everyone say? Amen. 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 So, um, I mentioned yesterday that I am a father of two uh, precious boys, Caden and Chase. I call them my, my two biracial bundle of joy. Um, they have big curls. Um, they, are the, they are my heart. And so uh, I remember uh, the first time uh, that I took Caden home from the hospital when he was born. I was a first time dad. And I'm sure, I know most of you cannot relate, but let me just tell you, it's one of the scariest moments in your entire life. Um, and I remember. Um, so they, uh, amen. So I remember uh, uh, they were uh, preparing to send us home from the hospital with this new baby boy. And first, first of all, when, when they began to prepare us, I thought they were crazy. See, they don't really ask you many questions. You go to the hospital, you have a, a, a baby, then they send you home. They pat you on the butt, go home. I was like, I'm crazy. You don't want to send me home with a baby, right? No one's giving me an instruction, no manual to this little thing. What am I going to do when he poops? I don't even know. <laughs> but they don't tell you nothing. They just send you home. And I remember driving home uh, with my wife and uh, Caden in the back. And I remember in the middle of driving, um, I was consumed with this sense of protecting him. I can't even explain it. Like, all of a sudden, it, it just became aware that what I had in my possession was uh, so precious and so valuable that I must do everything to, to protect him. Like, I remember driving, and I, and I imagined myself, I've seen too many action movies, I, rem I imagined myself as I was dri driving, there was this car next to me with this little old white lady, and I imagined she was my enemy trying to kill my son, right? And I imagined myself running her off the road, right? Yeah, it ain't a good story. But look, because I'm going to go to jail doing that. But oh, look. But I, it, it, I felt it, and I looked at her, I was like, I am going to scare this white woman, and she's going to call the cops on me. This ain't going to go well, Curtis, right? But I can't, I can't tell you otherwise outside of this is what I felt when I was aware of how precious I, uh, of what I had in my possession, that for the first time, I was aware that his value his, was enough for me to, to, to protect to give my life for this, to do everything so that nothing affects, tarnishes, hurts him in any way. In fact, I would tell you the hardest thing about being a parent is sending your child into a world that you know will hurt them, but you give your life to protect because you, you want to protect what's most precious, right? Like, like, it doesn't have to be a child. We all have things that are valuable. We all have things that are, we call precious, that, that we say, man, we, we protect, we lock up, we hide. Uh, so just th throw things out. What's, what's valuable in your life that, that you say, uh, I must protect it? Throw ideas out to me. Shoes. shoes. Who says shoes? Shoes. Brother, I am with you. My wife will tell you that. I'm with you with my shoes. Don't nobody mess with my shoes. What else? A dog. Jesus, a dog? Dude, Food? 
Food, brother. I don't know the house you live in. You got to protect your own food, but I like it. What? Gummy bears. Gummy bears. Yes and amen. What you got? Wife. wife. You got that right, brother. Are you married? You're a young fuck talking about wife. <laughs> brother, you preparing well for your wife, brother. <laughs> brother, you're going to make a good one. All right? You, you protect what's valuable. I think someone over here uh, yelled out Jesus. And uh, what we're going to see today is that this Jesus that we talked about yesterday, this Jesus who is the originator, the original, who sits over creation, speaks it into existence, and he is, who is the head of uh, the church, and who is the church we are, all right? You are. And, and he who gave his life to bring those who were separated in uh, Paul is going to say, if, if that is true, if, if, he, if, if he is all of that, which is true, and if you experience that, then what you must do is guard it with your life. What you must do is, is protect it with all that you have and know. And so we are going to look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And this is really the heartbeat of what he's going to, he, Paul, Remember, a little recap that he's writing to a group of people who uh, began to doubt God, to, be, to doubt Jesus, to, to add things to Jesus, right? They were, they were walking through the, the buffet of religion and picking up all kinds of pieces to add to Jesus and minimizing who Jesus is. And, and Paul is saying, man, Jesus is so precious. One, don't add to him. But two, w- w- when you have him, when you know him, you must guard him. When you know him, you can't be passive with living for Jesus. And I won't have you raise your hands, but if you are here and you would say, "Um, I am one of them. I am am a Christian. Like I am one who has given my heart, my life over to Jesus Christ, who sees him as one who died on the cross for me and bringing me into his family. If you are there. That what's very important is that you guard what's true about you. That you guard. And I'll tell you, you might be young and say, oh, I ain't that important. Can I tell you, this is the age you start. Um, that many of you, just by numbers, if I just do numbers, statistics, that's it. That many of you who say you know Jesus today, in 6th, ninth, 11th grade, by the time when you leave home, and go to college and start your, your young adult years, then many of you will walk away. Then many of you will not acknowledge what you're excited about saying is true today. Just by numbers they say that. So what that tells me is we don't wait till then to start guarding. If it's true for you today, if you know Jesus today, you start now. You start guarding now because everything in this world is tempting you to walk away. And so Jesus um, is to be guarded. And Paul is going to answer the questions of how? What what, what do we do to to guard Jesus in our heart? To guard our lives for him? First, we we guard by following how we begin. Let's uh, read Colossians chapter 2 verse 6. And if you know chapter 2, the chapters are the big, bold numbers, and then the verses are the, the smaller numbers, all right? In Col- Col- Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, we're going to read. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it. Actually, no, we'll stop there. Continue to live. Just as you received, uh, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord. Now, what, what we're learning here is that it's important that we know what we received and how we received it. It's important that you know what you received and how you received it. Now, I don't care how old you are, if, if you say, I am a Christian anyway, it's important that you know what does that mean? It doesn't mean you, you, you don't have to get up here preaching it and be able to explain it the way I explain it. But you got to know for you, why is, is Jesus that way for you? 
What does it mean for you to be a Christian? Because I would argue that when I have spent time with teenagers, older teens, who questioned and wrestled, uh, many times it's because they really didn't know. Like they thought they were walking out the right, the right and the real thing. But over time, they realized that they were, um, they, they said yes to something that appeared to be true, but, but not really. They, they said yes, not to Jesus being Lord of their life. They said yes to Jesus making their life better. And when you get really older, you realize that doesn't happen that way. That causes you to doubt. They, they said uh, yes to, not because Jesus was theirs, but, but it was convenient because their parents said yes and their friends were saying yes. So they just jumped into the pep rally of saying yes, yes to Jesus. I love Jesus. Yes, I do. I love Jesus. How about you? And they get excited about it. And then they said yes. Not really knowing what they're saying yes to, just saying yes to the convenience and excitement around them. They said yes, because they, like many of us, they want to be good people. That's, ain't that what a good person does? I mean, if Jesus is good people, good people say yes to Jesus, therefore I do. I say yes, because I'm a moral good person, and that's really what it all amounts to. And as the older they live, and, the, and life catches up to them, they realize they didn't say yes to Jesus as we saw yesterday. They said yes to a make-believe Jesus, a Jesus that was somewhat like a Santa Claus, a Jesus that was somewhat passive, a Jesus that was somewhat comfortable with being added to things but not realizing Jesus is never comfortable with that. And so you have to know why you know Jesus. How did they, how did we receive Jesus? We see Christ Jesus as Lord Christ. He is the full God sent by God. The, the Messiah, the Bible would say, really, is just, he's the one sent to fulfill all that the Old Testament said was true about him. He is, he is Christ Jesus, Jesus, the historical man who walked the earth and who, who in his full humanity, the incarnation, uh, it said that he died on the cross for us. We see Christ Jesus as Lord, as Lord, as one who is the leader not just of the world, but of our world, who is leader of not just all lives, but my life, that in his fullness, God and man, that we, we started by submitting ourselves to him, so, saying yes, full surrendering to him, joyfully bowing before him. And this we, we did, not begrudgingly or because of boring obedience, but because he's just that good, that he was worthy of it. And that maybe, maybe you've experienced this, but I just remember the, the, the first moment, I told a little bit of my story yesterday, the first moment I started walking with the Lord and, and, and walking with Jesus, living for Jesus, man, I was so happy. Like the sun began to shine like never before. And, and I, felt like, I felt like, man, I, could, I was breathing differently and, and I knew life differently. And there's this joy, this, this, I get to know this God personally. I gotta tell you, that is, if you've never experienced it, that's what he desires for you to experience. Not a boring, I have to live for Jesus, but a happy, I get to live for Jesus. And if you're here and your definition of living for Jesus is this begrudging obligation, can I tell you, you're getting it wrong. And by getting it that way, you're not guarding. And for some of you, some of you, you're not guarding what's true. Some of you, it's never been true for you. Some of you should wrestle. Am I really believing this Jesus or did I say yes to something that was somewhat of a make-believe Jesus? For this Jesus, he is no doubt Lord and leader, but he loves and he brings us in to live out this life in relationship with him. So he says, Paul says, just as you received him, continue to live in him. Another translation says walk in him. I like that. Walk. Walk in him. You, 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 you know, I, we, we can tell who people are uh, by their walk, right? 
Like, like if somebody is, is walking like this, they a bodybuilder, right? All right? They think, oh, my man hairy his hands. That's how I walk. That's how I walk, right? When I remember in high school, we played football. Somehow, we as football players thought we had to walk through the halls like this. But if you're walking through the halls at school and you see somebody walking like this, they're a freshman. You know they're scared, right? <laughs> Sorry, freshman, but that's just often common. All right? If you know somebody, they walk like this. They are a model and they look like me. But uh, you can tell a person by their, their walk. Like I remember an old guy in my neighborhood. He was uh, stuck in the 70s, right? Because every time he was walking the street, he would just walk like this. Don't nobody walk like that no more. Bro, that was 70s, right? But you can tell somebody by just how they walk. And what Paul is saying is we can tell really what you think of Jesus by how you, how you walk, how you live for him. Like your, your life, your life will tell. And we're going to even talk about my, that more detail tonight. Like the thing, the elements of our lives that are meant to tell of the, of the truth of Jesus. But what Paul is telling us is guard by how you walk with him. You guard by continue to see him and live for him as a loving Lord. Live submitted to him. Like, that means when we say live submit, that means we let Jesus determine how we treat our friends, how we treat our parents, how we, uh, what we do on the internet, how we do on our grades, how we do in sports. Like, like that's what we would submit. This big word is saying, you let Jesus tell you how to do all those instead of you dictating how you do all those. And so continuing is living a life where Jesus really does get the call, the shots. And it's interesting um, that in my experience, I used to be a youth pastor, and, and I still spend a lot of time with high school students, college students. And so often, when I've known someone who genuinely loved and walk with Jesus, and they begin to come back to me, and they say, man, Pastor Curtis, I'm just, I'm doubting this Jesus thing. Like, I'm not really sure about him. Like, there's these other things that I'm hearing, and so often, so often, I mean, more often than not, it's not that they've heard something new. When I begin to ask more questions about how they've been living for Jesus, at the, at the root of it, often, is they have given up an area of their life where they've taken back control and not listening to him anymore. Sometimes it's, it's in the area of, of how they deal with their purity and, 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 and sexuality with their, with their girlfriends and boyfriends, that they've crossed some lines. And as they've done that, what was easier for them was not to say that's true and say, I have failed, Lord, uh, Lord forgive me. Instead, they begin to turn it into these arguments. Uh, well, maybe Jesus ain't real. So often, it doesn't start because we all of, a, all of a sudden got smart in our own ways. So often, there's just an area in our life where we just quit, quit believing that he truly was leader, and we took back control. And our way of dealing with that shame and guilt is by saying, maybe Jesus isn't who I thought he was. We continue by Living for him. It says rooted and built up. Rooted as a strong tree with deep roots. Built up in Christ. Built up in him. That means the foundation, our identity is in Jesus Christ. It means when you walk into school, when you talk to your friends, when you're playing on your sports team, that your identity, your hopes and dreams are in him. That no matter what happens in your life, you're safe in him. That no matter what someone says about you, they can't determine who you really are because he's already said, you are my son, my daughter, and I love you. That even when we fail, we blow it and we mess up, because if you have walked with Jesus, you will. Walking with Jesus is not you have arrived at perfection. It's just you've been forgiven with grace. But when you blow it, you don't just start believing that, that Jesus functioned with kind of an Instagram mindset. You know, Instagram mindset is you put your best life in the, in the, with the best filter, 
on the best day out there so that everybody believes you got the best life. I'm living my best life. Right? That's Instagram, but we will take that to Jesus and think Jesus is only interested in my, the best parts of me on my best day when I'm killing it for him. But when I blow it, uh, he's not really interested and we start running from him. But when you're rooted and built in him, you don't run. You, you go to Jesus and you say, Jesus, I did blow it. Jesus, I, I, in that moment, I wasn't living and functioning the way I know I, I was supposed to. And I'm sorry. That's what it looks like to continue. And it says, it says something at the end of verse 7. Overflowing with thankfulness. I like it. I like this. All right. There's, there's these things. There's these signs, these marks that, that every Christian, every, if you know Jesus, it, it, it's just meant to be on you. Like, it's meant to be like a tattoo on every Christian, right? Whether you got a tattoo on you or not, there's this, these things that Jesus would say, this should be tattooed on every Christian so that, so that when someone sees you, they just know there's something different about you, right? That, that you just resemble something that's very different. And for Christians, thankfulness is one of those consistent things. You realize that? Like being grateful, being thankful is one of the, the signs that you are really in Jesus and the ways you guard Jesus in your, your heart. Here's why that matters. By being thankful, what that means is um, you're, you're remembering who Jesus is and what he did for you, that he died on the cross, that he forgave you. You're remembering that and remembering that's a big deal. That's not normal, and not everybody gets it, but I get it. And you're always saying every day, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And it's that, that thankfulness that guards your heart, that, that drives you back to him every day. Thank you, Jesus. So I've been married uh, 13 years. My lovely bride named Shelly, and uh, man, it's important for me to, to guard my marriage, right? Especially nowadays where, uh, man, people just, just like, just like how, how it is in, in high school, people in and out of relationships, adults, we have to believe we do the same thing with marriage, in and out of marriage. And I recognize I do not want that. Man, I want to love my bride. I want to protect my marriage. I, like, I want to be old and wrinkled. I want to be a black raisin with my bride. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I want to be sitting in rocking chairs, angry at people with my bride, right? That's what I want. How do I, how do I get there, though? How do I get there? Well, there are certain things that you have to work hard to do, but one of the best things that I know to do is to always remain grateful for my boo. Like, like every day, like, because she's been married to me 13 years, now, she know I'm crazy, right? Like, she didn't have to deal with some stuff with me. She didn't have to forgive me, be patient with me. She didn't have to hold me when I'm weak and I'm weeping and I just want to give life, give up on life in all ways. She's walked with me and, and been my sister. She's prayed for me when I didn't even have words to pray. And, and, and every time I think of that, I just say, thank you, Lord, for my boo. Thank you. You know how I protect? I want to go on dates with her. I want to talk to her. I want to hear her voice. I want to hear her laugh. She got a laugh. She got like one of those belly laughs. And when she laughed, everybody here, I love it. <laughs> love it. You know how I guard is by saturating myself with all the goodness of what makes my wife who she is. Because when I am saturated with that, you can't tell me nothing. I don't care about what's happening around me. When I'm saturated with her, shoot. Ain't nothing, ain't nobody better. Well, that's Jesus, right? Like, how do you protect yourself? You, you saturate yourself with all that makes Jesus beautiful and treasure. And that you spend time with him. You talk with him. And that you come to him when you're weak and you're weeping. And you experience him lifting you up and you're like, like, thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me and protecting me. 
Uh, my fear is so often Christians, and, and young and old I've seen this, where we just have this sense that Christianity is just meant to be serious, stoic, and boring. And there is no zeal and excitement and joy and thankfulness. And I do believe that's one of the reasons why our hearts drift from Jesus. It's because a lack of thankfulness is a lack of, of, of awareness of what he's done. And you know, one of the ways that your thankfulness is going to always be expressed in your singing, like the Bible calls us to sing, and to sing boldly and with, with joy and thanksgiving. So I can tell you that if I was up here watching you sing, I'm not, I was back there, so I'm not saying anything about y'all. I didn't see y'all faces, but I can tell you that by your face engaging in the words on the screen, the way that you sing, there's a zeal. I'm not saying it has to be, you got to be jumping all around, but there's a, there's a way of singing that I can tell you if you really have seen them, experienced them. And no one. Maybe this weekend, um, maybe as they are leading us in singing, that those who truly know him, that we will sing as though we do. And if you don't know that, would you ask him to help you to have hearts of thanksgiving? Because thanksgiving and thankfulness is what God will use to guard your heart. Next, he will guard it by helping you not settle for anything less than Jesus. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human t- tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Simply put, what, what, what it's saying here is, hey, there are these persuasive ideas, mindsets out here that are persuasive and to a degree seem and sound right. But you got to guard yourself by not settling for that which may seem right, but is so far from who Jesus is. Here's just some examples, all right? Some examples that I know is true in the world we live in and is likely true to some degree in many of us. First, the idea of karma. Do good, and good will come back to you. Or, as what's often said, you'll hear it on TV, uh, uh, actors say it, musicians, rappers say it, like, put good into the universe, and the universe will bring good back to you. And can I tell you, that idea undermines Jesus, who's Lord over the universe. The universe ain't got no control over nothing. Jesus is who controls it all. It undermines him and it undermines grace. For if we received, if Jesus gave us all that we put into the universe, do you know what we deserve to receive? Death. Separation. Hell. That's what we deserve. If we're going to play by that equation to, to... to the degree of what we put into the world to come back, then you don't want that. But Jesus changes the equation and puts grace in there so that you don't actually get what you deserve, but get what you don't deserve, which is lavish love, peace in Christ, and a dad who's crazy about you. That's what you get. Not karma. Next, uh, life is about living your truth. I'm going to live my truth, you know. I'm going to do me. What I feel is what's most important. It's very dangerous because we will believe, we will support that we as individuals couldn't define what's true or not. But what Jesus has told us and showed us in the first chapter last night is that Jesus exists outside of of our reality and he defines what's true for all things under him. 
We don't get to say, well, because I feel it, this is what's true. We don't get to say, because, uh, well, uh, this is my truth. This is how I want to be. So therefore, whatever I see as true, that's what dictates everything and everyone around me. This is important. This is dangerous because you're submitting to you. And it's so interesting how often it's, I, I blow my own mind, how quick I believe that I know enough about life to obey my own truths and feelings. Like, for real, like, I know life. I just quit peeing in the bed a few years ago, right? Like, I, no, not really. But look, uh, uh, look, pretty much when I was 10, I was still peeing. Yeah, don't, don't, don't ask me nothing. All right. But let's take you. It's so interesting that because you can play Fortnite, you think you know life. Like, it, it's so interesting. Like, we can't get A's in algebra, but we know to tell Jesus everything. Like, it's interesting that we think we are the kings of the world. So, therefore, we get to tell Jesus our truth. And I'm telling you, I'm there. So often, I want to tell Jesus my truth and how life should look. And Jesus is saying, mm, when did you become Lord? But that's what we often give ourselves to, is what we think is true, what we feel is what's true. Uh, next, life is about my happiness. Life is about my happiness. We'll, we'll tuck that in, and I'll tell you, this is very common. We will tuck that into Jesus, and we will think Jesus is then now about our happiness. That the purpose in life is that I experience the greatest level of happiness. Now, can I tell you, Jesus is not an enemy of your happiness. But your happiness isn't the goal. Remember, you were created for him. He is the goal. He is the purpose of everything. Life isn't about your happiness. And this is important because you will think that when, when something goes wrong in your life, Jesus has now failed you. I remember when I was a youth pastor and a young man who loved the Lord, by all appearances loved the Lord, and then he went through a bad breakup with his girlfriend and then walked away. Because in that moment, he just believed. But Jesus isn't who I thought he was because he didn't give me what would make me happy. Like, I remember, I, I wrestled with this as a grown man, uh, as a pastor. Remember, a few years ago, I went through this long season of life where uh, there's a lot of hard things happening. Like, in a, in a span of about a year to a year and a half, I had attended anywhere from 10 to 12 funerals. Three of those funerals, my dad, one of my close friends, and one of my best friends spread out three months apart. And then you add a whole lot of life that just never goes right. And I remember going to Jesus, and I'm saying, Jesus, how could you do this to me? I mean, I'm Curtis. I am a pastor. I'm out here preaching your word, doing what you, I'm trying to help kids know you. I don't deserve this. And Jesus just gently reminded me, Curtis, first, I've never been about your happiness. I've been about you loving me fully and experiencing me deeply. And sometimes that happens when life doesn't go your way. And Curtis, you know what? You're not the best dictator of what your happiness really is. I am. And maybe you're here and you just think Jesus just should make things easier, better. And sometimes Jesus is so kind, he really does. Like I could tell you situations that Jesus did make easier for me. But the goal isn't easy. The goal is 
Am I seeing Jesus as Lord? Am I following him and loving him fully as Lord? And then lastly, another mindset that we give ourselves to. Life is short, get yours. Every generation has done it. Years ago, it was carpe diem. Seize the day. A few years ago, it was YOLO. You only live once. Every generation has their version. <laughs> Life is short. Get yours. Like, you, you get to determine what makes you happy, and you just go for it. Forget what Jesus says. Forget how he has called you to live. Just get yours. And Jesus says, if you add any of these to me, you have diluted me, and you have failed to see me as I've shown you myself to be. That he is the originator, the creator, the leader, and the Lord. So are you living as though he's Lord? And are you guarding your heart in that same way? Have you let your guard down and you've confused Jesus for some things? And then we'll end. But so a couple other ways to guard your heart. Your heart, one, you guard by enjoying all that Jesus has given you. Verse 9, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And then verse 10, and you have been given fullness in Christ. You guard by enjoying all that God has given to you in Jesus. He has given you everything you ever will need. Every strength. Wisdom, grace, love, everything you ever, ever will need. If, you're in, if you think you are lonely, he says, no, I have, I have so guaranteed that you will never be uh, alone for the rest of your life that I have come to live inside of you. That no Christian could ever say, I'm alone. I am the fullness that you need. You're battling depression. I, I'm the fullness of what you need. You are, you're battling a bitter heart. I'm the fullness of what you need. You are afraid and fearful. I am the fullness of what you need. Enjoy it. Give yourself fully to it. It's when we minimize and we just simplify Jesus, which we often do, that Jesus is simply a man who died on the cross to forgive us for our sins. Once we say yes to that, we put them on the shelf, and we say, now life is all about everything else. And we forget to keep enjoying him in the fullness that he is. And then last, we guard by remembering all that he's accomplished for us. Verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. You know what he accomplished? You were dead, and now you're alive in him. And it's hard for us to understand dead, because we're just sitting here. But outside of Christ, it would say that we are dead. And what Jesus did, if you know Jesus, what he did is stand before the tomb, in front of the tomb of your heart, and he called your name. And when he called your name, spiritual life rushed into your heart, and that you became alive in him, that now you are connected to him, and that could never be separated from him. And we must remember that that is what's true for us, and that he did amazing things to make that real, like, like he made us alive by triumphing and di- disarming all of our enemies. This is what it says in the rest of the verses. Verse 15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. Um, You are connected to the God warrior. You ever had a friend that, man, um, he was just big and could fight, and it gave you a confidence. Like, actually, I grew up fighting. I'm not proud of it, but I grew up fighting. And uh, I wasn't the biggest dude. And so there was other groups that, that we would fight with. But, but you knew what? I was, I was always confident because I had a, a friend named Kareem. See, in, in high school, 
Kareem was built like a 38-year-old. You ever have, you ever got any of them in your high school? Like, they got mustaches and stuff, right? Like, they are big, and they are triple the size of every average teenager in the world. This is Kareem. So with Kareem, so Kareem was part of my crew. So I'm always bold. I'm like, I don't care what you say. I got Kareem, right? I got Kareem. In fact, there were times that I got caught without Kareem, and, 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 and it didn't go well for me. <laughs> but I always left with confidence. But Kareem will be back tomorrow. And you better watch out. Because <laughs> when me and Kareem walk up, we wreck and shop on all y'all. I do not support fighting, by the way. <laughs> do not take that home to your mamas. But bigger than that, God is the eternal Kareem. He is the God warrior, the Bible says, that when your worst enemies, the devil, demons, sin, death, tried to come for you, he showed up to the cross of Jesus Christ and conquered them all. So therefore, if you just walk with understanding all these things, this is what guards your heart from fading and drifting and believing things that are inconsistent with who Jesus is. So the question I want to leave you with is, are you guarding your life? Are you guarding your heart? Are you guarding it by, by continuing to, to, to follow him in the same way you began? With thanksgiving? With hope? Are you living for him as though he's still a leader of every area of your life? Are you guarding by not settling for anything less than Jesus? Are you guarding by enjoying all that Jesus has given you? And are you guarding by remembering all that he's accomplished for you? And like I began, my son was the most precious thing to me. Still to this day, I tell people often, there are a few people I'll go to jail for, but I'll go to jail for my son. You, work, you mess with my son, it's a wrap for you. And Jesus said, man, that's how you should view the gospel. I get it so precious that you would say, I would do anything to guard it. Because this is everything, everything I'll ever need, and everything that makes me who I truly am. So are you guarding it? Let's pray. Lord, I pray. I pray that you would protect those who are yours. I pray, Lord God, that you would so solidify who they are in you. I pray that this group of people would be very different than, than what the numbers say, that when a Christian teen leaves their home, they're more prone to walk away. I pray that that becomes untrue for this group of people. I pray that right now, whether in sixth grade, in eighth grade, and in tenth grade, that they are treasuring what's true, and they are guarding it, and they are living according to your word, and they are remembering and enjoying and being thankful. And they remember, Lord God, that you are the God who conquered all for them. So help us guard what's most precious. In your son's name we pray. Amen.